Hi, good evening. Welcome to our studio, uh, which is also somehow a sanctuary, a sanctuary. I want to really uh, uh, pay an homage to the, san the sanctuary for families because I know a lot about it because of Alexei, and it is such wonderful and special work. Um, the idea that people are, I mean, girls, I guess, mostly girls? No, not really. Uh, the, the idea that anyone is manipulated is just such a horrible disgrace. And, and uh, in, in your movie, Stolen Youth, it's, you really understand it. And uh, so it's, you know, we live in a very strange world and it's very hard to understand what's going on. And, and, um, and so it's more than ever, it's very important to look for the light and give the light and share the light and grow the light because eventually it's always the light that pushes the darkness away. And that's what I think everyone here in this room does. Uh, Gershon, I, I can't pronounce her full name, so where is she? <laughs> All right then. So welcome, and we're happy you're here. Thank you. Thank you so very much. It all started with a scenario that we know only too well at Sanctuary for Families. An abusive intimate partner who had tried to destroy his victim's relationship with their child violated a family court custody order. The psychological evaluation ordered by the court described him as, quote, literally impossible to evaluate because he is able to manipulate and control almost any situation in which he finds himself. He can be utterly charming, and one can be disarmed by his childlike simplicity and smile. But Mr. Ray is no child. He is a calculating, manipulative, hostile man. In prison for violating parole, Larry Ray emerged to carry his perpetration of gender violence to a whole new level. Moving into his daughter's dormitory at Sarah Lawrence, he found a new group of victims, targeting them strategically and relentlessly with a set of tactics honed by political torturers. Amnesty International calls it psychological torture. One, isolation of the victim. Two, induced debility, producing exhaustion, weakness, or fatigue. Three, monopolization of the victim's perceptions through obsessiveness and possessiveness. Four, threats of harm to the victim or their family and friends and other forms of threat. Five, degradation, including humiliation, insults, and denial of privacy. Six, forced drug or alcohol use. Seven, altered states of consciousness. And eight, occasional reinforcers that keep alive the hope that torture will cease. But these weren't political prisoners. These weren't prisoners of war. They were college students at a, an elite and very liberal, liberal arts institution, completely unprepared for the escalating campaign of seduction, manipulation, and psychic destruction waged by this master predator. How Larry Ray honed these insidious skills, we may never know, but what seems clear is that many of us at particularly vulnerable times in our lives would also have succumbed. Remember another college student named Patty Hurst? And remember how she was penalized and blamed. In spite of the work of our movement, victim blaming is still far too prevalent. 
Why were you out at 2 a.m.? Why did you stay? And most recently, why didn't you scream? Or as one of our panelists was recently asked by a widely respected MSNBC television host, how did you let this happen to you? There is a psychological dynamic behind such questions beyond their obvious misogyny. It feels better to think that this never could have happened to you or to your kids. I know that this gender aware audience understands the harm of victim blaming, which only serves to provide cover to perpetrators like Larry Ray and excuse their crimes. While our legal system eventually held Larry Ray accountable and sentenced him to 60 years in prison, it was two journalists writing for New York Magazine who exposed the horrifying crimes he inflicted on six bright college students for a decade and who forced that system to take action. And it was a documentary filmmaker who was given his victim's voice chronicled their journey from victimization to self-determination, and empowered them to teach us how predators operate. I'm so honored to introduce that documentary filmmaker, Zach Heinzerling. An Academy Award nominated and Emmy Award winning director, Zach's critically acclaimed debut feature, Cutie and the Boxer, premiered at the 2013 Sundance Film Festival, where it won the directing award for US documentary. Among the praise Zach has been showered with um, is this um, sentence from The New Yorker, which called Stolen Youth a remarkable work advancing the prestige true crime genre's slow but steady reorientation towards centering victims. Then next to Zach is Dr. Chicha Raghavan, professor of psychology, director of the Forensic Mental Health Counseling Program, and coordinator of victimology studies at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. She has written over 40 journal, journal articles and two books on traumatic stress and coercive control. Um, Dr. Raghavan's groundbreaking research and expert testimony about coercive control and traumatic bonding has enlightened judges and juries, parole boards, and a governor in a wide array of cases involving sexual assault, human trafficking, and domestic violence. Next to Dr. Raghavan is Alexi Ash Myers, the Anti-Trafficking Policy Director for Sanctuary for Families, who leads Sanctuary's work advancing the equality model, a survivor-centered approach to combating human trafficking. Alexi, um, previously she was a special victims prosecutor for the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. Um, she serves as a board member of the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women and Human Rights First. And next to Alexi, Daniel Barbon Levin holds an MFA in poetry from the University of California, Irvine, where he taught creative writing and rhetoric and a bachelor's degree from Sarah Lawrence College. He is the winner of the Lipkin Prize for Poetry, the Lynn Garnier Memorial Award, um, and is the recipient of numerous prestigious fellowships. His writing has appeared in many prestigious publications, too many to name. Um, Nylon called his memoir. Um, each of you has a copy of this extraordinary book, Slotum Woodstein, um, a disturbing, extremely vulnerable and extraordinary account of what happened to Levin and the emotional and psychological fallout. Um, significantly, he executively produced Stolen Youth. In that beautiful Diane von Furstenberg 
<laughs> is Felicia Rosario, who was born in New York City to immigrant parents from the Dominican Republic. Felicia attended Harvard College, where she studied biochemical studies, and Peer Review published her thesis work in the journal Molecular and Cellular Biology. She went on to study medicine at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. While at Columbia, she was president of the Black and Latino Student Organization and co-chair-elect for the Northeast Region of the Latino Medical Student Association. Felicia is currently working as an IT and management consultant and teaches SAT prep to underprivileged students in her spare time. She hopes to return to the practice of medicine and one day specialize in forensic psychiatry. How wonderful it felt to read those last two bios. Um, so a content warning. Um, this subject matter is painful and upsetting and please feel free if you need to just take a break to step out at any time. This is hard stuff to face. And I think we're going to start with our first clip. He just looked like a dad. I have the image in my mind of Talia jumping into his arms. Larry's actually not that big of a guy, but in my memory, he's big and she just like vanishes in his arms. He talked for hours and everyone was just transfixed. Larry talked about being in the Marines. It was a huge part of his identity. He talked about his time in the CIA doing psyops against foreign leaders, infiltrating the inner circle of their you know, top brass and messing with their minds. He talked about how he had worked with NATO to help in the Kosovo crisis. He says all these outlandish things and you're wondering, did this really happen? And then you pull out this letter and you're like, okay. He talked about how he was Gorbachev's guide when Gorbachev came to the US. And then he would pull out a picture with him and Gorbachev and you're like, what the hell? I remember I didn't really care, but everyone else was like, wow. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> he brought up Bernie Carrick that night. He talked about how there were corrupt law enforcement who were working against him. I Googled. Carrick is a former New York City police commissioner who was a familiar face in the days after the September 11th attacks. Larry Ray is the FBI informant who was once Bernie Carrick's close friend. His Larry had blown the whistle on some major scandal. Anything I say, I have documents to support. And they had gotten retribution against him for that. According to Larry, these very powerful people had put him in jail on trumped up charges. They had tried to ruin his life, and now he could pick up the pieces and like fight the good fight. Zach, four years ago, New York Magazine published the riveting and disturbing cover story that exposed Larry Ray's psychological and physical enslavement of six promising young people, um, universities, college students. What was it about this article that resonated so powerfully that you would spend the next four years of your life, much of it during the pandemic, making this documentary. Well, thanks for having me. Um, and thanks for doing this panel. I, I have to say that Sanctuary is kind of an unsung hero in this whole documentary. Uh, they provided, assisted in providing counseling and legal services for four of Larry's victims, some of whom were still in touch with Larry when they decided to um, you know, get counseling from Sanctuary. Um, 
So navigating the sort of sides in what was a very entangled web of uh, emotionally um, you know, tied individuals who were under immense trauma is something I am incredibly grateful for and really the, the, is part of why this documentary even exists. So I just have to say that, thank you for that. Um, as far as the article, I hadn't even read the article when uh, Daniel reached out. Um, and Daniel's book was really my entry point to this whole project. Um, the article was, of course, important in leading to the indictment of, of Larry and really was mostly a, almost like a greatest hits of all of Larry's accomplishments and, the, and sort of abuses throughout his storied life and left this big question, which was kind of how did this happen and who are these victims? Um, and Daniel, uh, which he does so brilliantly in this book, puts you in the shoes of someone who is experiencing the kind of manipulation that Larry excelled at. Um, and I think the real question that I think I had and a lot of people had in this article was, how did this happen? And that led me to, well, this is a survivor story. This is a story of survival. This, you know, I, I had the chance to meet Larry. Uh, I met him a few times. I interviewed him for the documentary. Um, but the Larry I met was not the Larry that Daniel and Felicia knew when they first met Larry. And for that reason, it really wasn't interesting or part of the goal of the project to put Larry in the film. It was much more interesting to see what happened before Larry, who were these people, and how they survived um, you know, this trauma. So yeah, my book was the entry point, essentially. Oh, thank you. Um, and I think you've started to answer my second question, but maybe you can continue. In the course of your documentary, you made an important and strategic artistic choice Instead of focusing on the perpetrator, Larry Ray, as the authors of the New York Magazine article did, you shifted your lens figuratively and literally to his young victims. We understand who Larry Ray was and what he did through their eyes. They are the protagonists and the narrators. Why did you make this choice? And what were the challenges and opportunities that you faced in, in pursuing it? Yeah, well, I really credit that decision to, to Daniel and, and Felicia, who are here. I mean, I think the whole ethos of this project, and, and you have to keep in mind, this article came out, and is there a buzz on the mic? A bit? Is it really? No, it's better now. Cool. Um, I'll start over now. Um, Basically, the article comes out, there are all these producers, you know, movie uh, studios that are hungry for this salacious, meaty article about a uh, college sex cult. And Daniel decides to really take ownership over this story and put his foot down and to announce that on behalf of the survivors, you know, we would like to tell this story we, this is our story that Larry co-opted, exploited, retold, and now you want to go and retell this story with your own interests. And I think, you know, Daniel sort of put a flag in, in the sand and said, you know, I want to try to do this in a different way. And, there, and, you know, never have we lived in an era where true crime documentaries are more popular. Um, cult documentaries, sex cult, college sex cult, I mean, just talking about it. Um, and I think Daniel wanted to do something different. And so talking to him about that, and then the next step was meeting Felicia. So I became interested in these people's lives. And the story for me became, how do we follow these people's lives from now? Felicia, at the time I met her, was living in the house that she had been with Larry, still in touch with Larry, who was calling her from prison, in, this, in a relationship with someone she'd been, you know, uh, 
under manipulation and abuse for for 10 years. And this, this was the story, right? This, this, I had to see how these people were going to survive what had happened to them and what happens after your abuser is arrested. What is that path like? What is the path of, of becoming free from the mental prison that you've been living in? Um, and that was so much more interesting than anything Larry could have told. I mean, one of the things that I, I will say this, in that meeting with Larry, I wasn't impressed by the charm and the charisma that Felicia and Daniel, I'm sure, uh, saw in a much younger, earlier version of Larry. But what I did notice was that Larry was able to weaponize social norms that exist and, and, and really are responsible for so much manipulation and abuse that we don't realize. The, the, the sheer fact that he can speak to someone at length for hours, and because I am, uh, you know, a, a polite individual, I will listen. And this is what he preys on. He preys on politeness. Um, he preys on the fact that he knows that the, it, you were raised to listen to adults, to authority figures. There's a power imbalance that exists that is not made obvious because of, you know, we're, we're essentially blind to it. And because I let him talk and talk and talk, he exhausted me <laughs> to a point of just sort of going along with whatever, I, this was a micro version of what they experienced in spades, of course. But I did see that and, and that made me think, okay, how do you translate in the, that into a film? Something that exists that people think is relatively normal, like listening to someone, can actually be weaponized as a, as a form of abuse. And, that, and that's something I think that people don't really understand is that there's a really implicit bias that we have to listen to authority figures that is the cause of, I think, a lot of what hopefully we'll talk about on this panel. So important. Thank you. Dr. Raghavan, over the last several years, there have been many highly publicized cases of mastermind psychopaths who have seized total control of multiple vulnerable victims and bent them to their will. Some of these cases take place in a cult context. Um, we think of Keith Ramir and Nexium. Others in the context of intimate partner violence, um, Harvey Weinstein, R. Kelly, and still others in the context of sex trafficking, e.g. Jeffrey Epstein. Are there common tactics these abusers deploy to wrest control of their victims? I think Zach has started identifying them and to break them down. Um, and if that is the case, would you please describe them and explain their impact on victims? Thanks, George, and I'll try. Um, I'm gonna need five minutes plus error of two around seven minutes. Um, so I think maybe one way to help us think about this is to divide the abuse process into two parts. And in the first part, I'm gonna call it prepping, but let's think about it as setting the stage. Um, I, I want us to, to call the, the abuser, you know, we often call them masterminds, and I think in a way that is true, but let's think of them in a less flattering term. Abusers are con men, right? So what do, they, they use the same tactics as do con men who steal your money, who get you to buy real estate that's worthless in Uganda by claiming that it's in a, on top of important copper mines, right? They use very similar tactics. And the first thing, that con men do is to figure out what your vulnerability is. Um, I want to go back a little bit to my college experience for one second, which is many, many, many decades ago. <laughs> I, I went to Smith College, and I remember it, which is a liberal arts college, very similar to Sarah Lawrence, and I remember how obsessed I was by the quest for truth, which for an 18-year-old is basically nonsense. Um, but you know, I thought I was very smart, I left home, I was exploring my thinking, I was exploring my sexuality, 
I thought I was intensely mature, um, and and I I explored the quest for truth, but other 19-year-olds were equally idiotic, and we <laughs> spent all night discussing philosophy, which I'm so glad nobody recorded because it's probably <laughs> gibberish. <laughs> the difference is we were exploring the quest with each other, and the only harm that came to us was we were horribly hungover more often than we should have been. Um, and, and that is a normal part of college life. Typically, liberal arts colleges, it pushes you to grow. It pushes you to explore. It encourages kind of intellectual autonomy. And in this particular case, the predator immediately stepped in as a kind of a pseudo upper level psychologist with you know, chops from the CIA, right? And what 18 or 19 year old would find that to be um, you know, just fabulation? They, so it's figuring out the vulnerability. I've had clients who wanted more than anything else marriage. That's what the trafficker offered. Clients who wanted more than anything else to feel abuseful. That's what the abuser offered. Clients who wanted fame and who were very talented. And that's what the abuser offered. So it's setting, it's sniffing out in this very cunning and um, predatory way. What is it that this person needs? What is this person looking for? And um, which I sometimes call predatory helpfulness. So offering to be helpful, but really figuring out your vulnerability. Once that starts, the manipulation starts, and we don't see it because it's so invisible. I think in a, the, so. This another important thing I want to convey is abuse is mostly lots of small invisible tactics. It's like a spider's web. Each little line that's thrown on you, you don't feel. And little by little, the web gathers around you and you start to be trapped. But at the very beginning, you don't feel it. And it almost always starts with very invisible manipulation. I think Zach's alluded to it. What you need for manipulation is the establishment of authority, credibility, which in this case was very easy. Um, he was the cool father, you know, who doesn't want a cool father? And, but also the idea that you, you need to trust the person in authority, and all abusers do that, they figure some way that you start to trust them. You also need not, to, you also should not get good perspective from others. Um, you know, why, why did I stop spouting gibberish sex philosophy? Because I actually took a philosophy class and I realized with intense humiliation that the things we've been talking about were nonsense. Um, and that, you know, and started to actually be more serious and more applied. I got another perspective, and a good one, right? You need to not have perspective. And so you do that by isolating your victims. You can isolate them physically, so, so they don't talk to others. You can isolate them psychologically, where you convince them, you seduce them, you flatter them, you overwhelm them. This is all manipulation that you don't need anybody else. And all abusers do it. Why do they do it? They do it because if you don't, if in that short period, we're still in part one, if you don't isolate them, the brain, uh, our sense of self will start questioning. We'll start saying, wait, 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 that's not making sense. That, that doesn't quite seem right to me. And that will start for some reason, within the first six months, usually within the first three months. So the first few weeks or months have to be intense, isolating, convincing, seductive, and abusers, all abusers, load it up the first few months, whether it's seduction technique, whether it's some other technique, whether they're scamming you for money, it's gotta happen quickly and overwhelmingly. I, I wanna take a little pause, a little digression, to say something that in psychology that, and in science really, in the US we're very afraid of, is the power of the mind. Um, for years we have acknowledged the power of physical body, but we are afraid of acknowledging that the mind is very powerful and can exert the same kind of control in different ways than in other, other forms of force. And we are, in group settings of abuse, so you'll see this more in cults and trafficking than domestic violence, people pick up fear from each other, right? So if everyone's afraid, then you start to get afraid. So the key here is to create anxiety in someone who others are close to, to create fear in others who someone are close to, and your body's gonna feel it, it's gonna sense it, it's gonna pick it up, and half of the control has become, has begun. 
And so there's emotional contagion that we're not aware of. And this is part of the invisibility of abuse. Um, when you ask someone, why were you so afraid? They often can't quite tell you. Some of, it, some of it is coming from this kind of emotional contagion because people in my group are afraid. Um, this is very hard to measure, but it can be measured. Some of it is also thought contagion, some, something we're afraid of discussing. If, lots, if people start thinking the same way the thoughts spread, um, we know this from propaganda, we know this from recent events in the US where people start to think alike. We've known this from Shakespeare's time, if you're interested, long before Shakespeare, but in Coriolanus, if you're interested, which is a gorgeous play, Coriolanus doesn't want to become the consul of Rome because he's afraid of the Roman mob. And essentially, he doesn't get a choice, and eventually, the Roman mob kills him um, because the propaganda, the message on whether or not he's a hero changes, right? So that's thought contagion. It's very powerful. In these abuse settings where there's more than one person, what you don't see is the fear contagion and the thought contagion that starts to overwhelm the mind. Once that's set, it's then, then the coercive control starts. Um, and I'm actually going to pause on what coercive control is because this has definitely been more than five minutes. <laughs> but it's, it's an abuse dynamic that breaks down and starts to little by little by little um, usurp control from the people that it's targeting. And I'll stop there, and at this time I'm happy to talk about it or uh, after the panel. Thank you so much. And I'm not quite, not quite yet, please. <laughs> we need more from you. Um, in her groundbreaking book on gender-based violence and trauma, Dr. Judith Lewis Herman, professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, gives equal weight to trauma and recovery. Stolen Youth does the same. Can you please address from your perspective, as the country's leading expert on gender violence and traumatic bonding, how recovery can be possible in the face of such severe coercive control, and what survivors, friends, family members, advocates, and communities can do faci to facilitate it? The audience will soon find out that it can never answer questions directly. I'll take the scenic, winding country route. Um, so, when you're manipulated and degraded and put down and isolated and intimidated, two things are being asked of you. One is that you accept the treatment, and two, which is really important, that you agree that the abuser is correct. So, a lot of what's happening here is ultimately to force the victim to say, you know what, these things are happening because there's something wrong with me, and, I, and thank you for pointing it out, um, in very literal, humiliating, ugly ways. And the reason the abuser does it is so that you comply, but also that you become, when you comply, it, your brain starts to imagine that you're consenting, as opposed to you're actually being forced. When you believe you're consenting, what do you feel? Think about when you did something that you thought was wrong, but then you thought you did it of your own free will. You feel intense shame. What is shame? Shame is the degradation of the self. So I'm sort of plotting that. So the first thing that survivors need to do is to forgive themselves. Um, and it, this is, sounds so easy, but it is not easy. The hardest thing to do in the world, really, is to forgive yourself and to not regret the things that you did and to understand that whether or not you had choice, no matter whether or not you thought you had choice, it's okay and you have to forgive yourself. And you have to rebuild your relationship to yourself because what abusers do is they break that relationship. If you have a relationship to yourself, you fight back. And so that has to be broken through the degradation and the harassment and the isolation. So you have to do two things, forgive yourself, which is so painful, because the only way you can forgive yourself is by looking inwards. And who wants to look inwards when what there is is such pain, right? So it is confronting the pain fully in order to forgive yourself. And what should society do? I think the first thing they need to do is to understand how difficult this is. It is, think of little things that you had to do to forgive yourself and how you didn't want to, but you, you wanted to squirm away from it because it made you feel small and icky. Think about trying to forgive yourself for years of abuse. Um, when you forgive yourself, the abuser loses power over you. 
And that is why you, you should forgive yourself. What society needs to do is to take responsibility for the abuse and take responsibility for it in small ways, but also in big ways. Small ways are, how, why are men allowed to rape and beat men and women? Why is it that when some, someone kills their boyfriend um, in, a, in a domestic violence fight, they go to jail? Like what kind of civilized criminal justice system arrests the survivor, right? Society needs to speak up and support. They also, you know, part of aiding is not just being political, it's also demanding more money for mental health. Society also needs to not pose victim blaming questions when they ask questions on TV. Mm -hmm. um, society needs to frame journalistic articles in a loving way. Um, so all of these things go a long, long way to, I think, building, repairing faith in humanity because the other thing that gets lost when you abuse is the faith in humanity. Right, so if the relationship to yourself is broken, the relationship to the world is broken. What does that mean in simple words? It means you don't trust the world. You don't trust humanity. So it is our job to rebuild that faith by showing that we understand it in ways that we can. We can't all understand, but in little ways, and to return that faith. Thank you so much. Thank you. Alexi um, is a former sex trafficking prosecutor and the director of anti-trafficking policy for Sanctuary for Families. You are acutely aware of the dynamics of sex trafficking and the tactics of traffickers. Of the many criminal counts Larry Ray was convicted of, it was actually the sex trafficking charge that was responsible to his sentence to decades in prison and prevents him from continuing to prey on more victims. And we know that he certainly would have. Does Larry Ray fit the profile of a sex trafficker? And if so, how? So he does. Um, Larry was appropriately charged and convicted of sex trafficking for coercing Claudia into prostitution. But really his behavior with all the victims displays similar patterns um, and tactics that, that traffickers use. Um, another thing I want to mention is that this case really demonstrates that anyone can be susceptible to coercion, abuse, and manipulation. Because each of these um, individuals were highly educated successful, had resources, were in an institution that was supporting them, and they weren't children, they were adults. Um, you'll hear from Felicia and Daniel in a bit who can speak a bit about their mindset at the time that Larry was deprogramming their brains, and that's really important to understanding that traffickers use on victims. When you think of trafficking, you probably think of the hostage situation and what you see in movies, but that's rarely the reality. Uh, the dynamic that we see often at Sanctuary with our clients is far more of psychological bondage than physical. So traffickers use tactics like seduction, engaging in intimate partner relationships like Larry did with Felicia, um, gaslighting and using that uh, to coerce their victims and control and exploit them. You saw so much of this with um, Larry convincing each of the individuals that this was their fault, that they had brought it upon themselves, that they deserved it. Um, so Chitra spoke a little bit about this, but a trafficker really begins by exploiting a person's need for love, care and affection, and, and whatever those needs are that they, that they, the vulnerabilities they find, they manipulate them. So he'll befriend you, he'll romantically pursue you, um, anything to lower your inhibitions. Then he'll figure, he could figure out what your dreams are and offer those as the solution in a, in a manner to manipulate you. Um, then after this stage, traffickers um, subject their victims to a breaking stage. So during this period, the exploiter makes the person um, that they're exploiting mentally dependent on them in order to facil facilitate that control. You'll find that traffickers may gaslight victims and punish them. Um, violently, which we saw a lot of in this uh, film, um, for, un for things that the trafficker or the exploiter deems as uh, infractions. Then they'll often also use rewards and, you know, they'll reward a victim with jewelry and roses, attention, affection, 
This really keeps survivors confused, scared, and um, always trying to regain their abuser's love. So you'll hear a lot, um, and, and you'll see a lot in the film from Felicia, um, and how he really, Larry really used these tactics to seduce her, to start an intimate partner relationship with her, while simultaneously he isolated her from her family, her community, made her trust nobody, moved her across the country, and um, just instilled immense fear in her. And then lastly, traffickers uh, make victims feel culpable for their own victimization, which is one of the most heartbreaking parts of the documentary for me to watch. Um, that's a result of trauma corresponding. Um, that you know that creates a powerful emotional bond between the abuser and the abused as a result of the ongoing cycles of abuse. So traffickers' psychological manipulation makes it very difficult for survivors to report that abuse, to testify against them, and to move on. Um, because of this tactic of manipulation, over time traffickers don't even need to use the violence anymore, the force to compel their cooperation from victims. They just become so attuned to it. Thank you, Alexi. Two sets of parents of Larry Ray's victims reported him to local law enforcement, only to be told that there was no probable cause for an arrest, no crimes were being committed, and any apparent abuse was consensual. The federal authorities ultimately responded very differently. Should New York law enforcement have recognized the crimes that Larry Ray was carrying out in spite of the denial of his victims and held him accountable? What can we better do to equip local police and prosecutors to identify perpetrators like Larry Ray and protect their victims? Yeah, so at the very least, um, law enforcement should be tr trained on traumatic bonding. They should do trauma-informed <laughs> interviews. They should know the dynamic and that their victims will deny the abuse or they will defend their abusers and that this does not mean it didn't happen or that there's no probable cause for arrest. Um, and law enforcement and prosecutors need to learn how to make more evidence-based cases and investigations that don't rely solely <coughs> on the testimony of a highly traumatized person. Um, in this case, they, they could have interviewed the friend of Larry's, the landlord who was lending the apartment. They could have interviewed professors, um, other students at Sarah Lawrence, but they solely relied on the interviews of the survivors. So they fell short when they did that. And then just the last thing I'll say is there's a lot of talk about reducing criminal justice response and eliminating law enforcement and scaling back. Um, but this case is a perfect example of the urgent need of the criminal justice system um, to have a response and that there are so many communities who are actually underrepresented by the criminal justice system and it's really a needed entity. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's another clip for us. He was putting so many things in the space we were bound to do something wrong. Mistakes need to be addressed, get addressed. In the apartment, there was this set of pans that just kept getting ruined. It's like hairline scratches. I have a question for you, right? Why did you damage the property? Larry had this really big thing about accountability. So if you did something wrong, you had to be honest and be held accountable so that you can feel like a real person in the real world and have like an actual, like decent life. You are my friend, you count to me. I didn't want you to be doing that. It would be like, why did you damage the stuff? Like, and I would say, I didn't. Let's work with that a little bit, okay? Okay. Given his skills and experience and knowledge, it's like, wait, if he's asking me about it, then there must be basis for it, except I don't remember doing it. And then I'd be like, I don't, I don't really remember. He'd be like, you remember. Think about it. What you remember is enough. It just has to really be what you remember. It can't be less than what you remember. Uh, this question is for you, Daniel. 
Um, Daniel, you were the first of Larry Ray's victims to recognize and to throw off the psychological bonds with which he took control of you and your friends. What enabled you to identify his tactics of psychological torture? What strengths and resources did you draw on to escape the psychological prison that he con constructed? Um, well, okay. first of all, I want to say this panel is incredible. Thank you so much. Um, having been put in a lot of situations in my life where um, uh, I'm not allowed to name what's going on, I have to say this is obviously very surreal. Um, as you can imagine, sitting up here three years ago, this was a secret. No one knew about this. My friends were still being harmed. No one knew, you know? And so I want to acknowledge how triumphant of a moment this is right now, because you think of all the people who are still, you know, in that situation where their story's not being told, right? So we're very lucky that we've gotten to this moment that I get to sit in front of you. Thank you for being a part of hearing these stories, letting them be told, creating a venue for that. Okay, so now to actually answer your question. Um, so, oh, as I didn't know you were gonna have my book, I, you know, I hope you like it. I, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, okay, so, uh, growing up as a closeted, you know, gender fluid, bisexual poet in the woods of New Jersey where kids were like showing me the buck knife that they would use on people like me. I, I became pretty good at um, living two lives, right? Um, that was my talent. Um, you know, and I was going home to a mom, you know, my mom's been sick my whole life. So I, I learned, I was pretty good at not really having needs, you know, not taking up a lot of space. Um, and performing, right? And um, Zach talked about, you know, how deferent we tend to be to authority figures. And I want to add to that that, you know, one authority figure that we, we often maybe don't think about as an authority figure is the hegemony, right? We're deferent to the hegemony. So I always was. Um, and that made me, in a lot of ways, uh, vulnerable to Larry, but it also was a strength because I knew how to hold on to this core truth about who I was, and I knew how to protect that. And the string, the golden thread that connected my outside and my inside for me was art, you know, it was poetry and writing and storytelling. And even while Larry was abusing me, I was still writing, right? I was still having that conversation between these parts of myself. And I think that allowed me to survive, right? Um, yeah. Um, so, it's a, it's a crazy situation. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, I have so much more to say about that, but I, you know, I can go forever. Thank you. Um, so maybe just one more question, Daniel. Um, Larry Ray, as well as some of the young people under his control, profoundly violated your trust. How is it possible after this experience to trust in and cooperate with Zach and his team? And if you could also respond to this question, what do you hope Stolen Youth, and actually your uh, extraordinary um, autobiography, what do you hope these works will accomplish? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I didn't trust anyone, you know, when I was living with this on my own. And especially after the article came out, as Zach alluded, there are a lot of people who are very hungry to tell this story, um, but not because they wanted to create a world with more understanding of people like me, not because they wanted people like us to be legible, right, to feel not othered anymore, but because they wanted to create profit and entertainment, right? 
And when I met Zach, it was clear that he wasn't trying to tell the story for those reasons. He wasn't trying to convince me of anything, which was really crucial, you know, having come out of a situation where I was feeling so manipulated. He was interested in exploring together what, what would the purpose of telling the story be? You know, what can we do with this? And I think he saw in it a meaningful way to touch on something critical about the human condition, right? Um, things that we've, everyone has talked about on this panel. You know, this story is an example. Um, as far as what I want this to do, you know, I, my grandma used to say, don't wash your dirty laundry in public. And I was like, what do you do when the most critical experiences that form your identity are dirty laundry, right? Like my whole life is dirty laundry, you know? Um, and I, I teach a class right now, a writing class for, it's generally for older adults uh, to translate their most difficult memories into writing, into stories. And I have people in that class over and over who are coming to me, talking about experiences they had across their whole lives as children, you know, that they haven't told the people who they're closest to. You know, when they're sharing it with me, they're sharing it in this classroom with other people like them. Why are these conversations, why are these conversations so difficult to have? You know, shame, people have talked about fear, social norms. But I bet everyone in this room has some version of a story that could be told, right, like this, you know? And I think that if we work together, we could foment a cultural shift where these stories, which are in fact, I think, the norm, could be out in the open. We could all be washing our dirty laundry together, you know? <laughs> Um, and I think that that would feel pretty good. Um, and for me, the way to do that, the only way I know how, is art, right? I think that's how you shift culture. Um, so I want to empower more people, more people like us, to tell their stories um, and to get those stories out there. Um, and I, I think that that can make a huge difference. Yes. Amen. Felicia. Felicia, while another one of Larry Ray's victims suffered sex trafficking, you endured extreme power and control in the context of an intimate partner relationship. The documentary shows how Larry Ray lured you into his web of control and abuse by holding himself out as a romantic partner. Um, and protector and, and pursuing you and luring you from California to New York to his web of control. What red flags do you now recognize about Larry Ray's behavior at the time that you would warn other women at risk about? Um, so, First of all, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Sanctuary. Thank you, Diane, uh, for having this amazing space uh, for us to be able to share. I love this wall, by the way. Did everyone see this? In charge. That's what Zach used to say to me when we do our interviews. He's like, you're in charge. You, take, you run the show. Um, so I just wanted to say that first. Uh, and then secondly, I actually want to address some part of your question, the, the first part of how, um, how you framed it. Um, so my relationship with Larry was actually very platonic and I actually never had relations with Larry. Um, so as far as him luring himself as a romantic partner, he did, but it was like a carrot. Like, if you go out and have sex with all of these people, then we can, then I will have sex with you and then we can get married. Um, I did not go for that. 
Uh, thankfully, I had enough of me left. Um, and it was just so such a horrible thing to be doing, which I did end up doing. He did force me to do it um, a few times, um, but I regressed severely and you know that actually stopped him from doing a lot of that and um so that i wanted to make clear because it's actually part of what happens when other people tell your story when other people when the media makes the narrative and they don't reach out and talk to you they don't ask you the person who lived it what happened so then the story of me is, oh, this young doctor gets manipulated and, you know, um, brainwashed and is becomes this guy's sex toy and is a broken person. It's like, well, <laughs> did anybody bother finding out who I was before that? What the context was? And then who I am now? No, right? And that's really harmful. Uh, I want to say that because think of if any of you have anything traumatic or anything, anything even, it doesn't even have to be close to this. You could have broken your leg when you were little playing, you know, hockey or something. And if somebody goes and set, tells a story, a different story, that's not what actually happened. Think about how hurtful that is. And so imagine having the most traumatic thing happen and then it's world news, right? Um, so that's, the media really has to be so much more responsible in how they tell the story, you know, because, and then also um, because it is re-traumatizing and it just, it gives, it, it's misinformation, right? Um, and then also we have to be more responsible as consumers is like, well, you know, what am I actually putting my energy into? What am I paying attention to? Um, am I going for the salacious, for the saucy headline or am I going for, you know, other news? Um, so that was, <laughs> that's, I just, ha I had to say that because that was actually a huge reason why I did the documentary to set the record straight. Um, and so to actually answer your question now, <laughs> um, what red flags would I say uh, to look for? Um, so Dr. Chita already, already, already said a lot of them, um, but for me, Larry started love bombing me, right? So he would, call me all the time or he would send me expensive gifts he would buy me lots of flowers um and just like shower me with stuff um so that's one thing and then when it's when it's inappropriate then i would say that you have to watch out for right like if you just met this person and they're giving you like five handbags at once <laughs> like that's a problem. I mean, it's really nice to have every color of your favorite handbag, <laughs> but <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. And then um, the next thing would be, he really, he took over my time. So he, he, con he dominated my time. He would call me morning, noon, and night. I would be, I would wake up. It would, it would be to his phone call. Mm -hmm. I would drive to work on the phone with him. I would be at work. And then we would be on. We would talk on my breaks. Get home, same thing, right? Until he became the only voice in the room, right for me. And I was, mind you, I was living alone in California in a new place. Um, so when the, when there's just when the person becomes the one voice in the room, that's a problem. Um, then the last thing, which goes into, goes, it comes from that, is he isolated me, right? I didn't, I, he, is, but he didn't just isolate me physically because I was already isolated physically from uh, my loved ones, but he um, emotionally isolated me from them. 
he told me that they were out to hurt me, that they were um, that they weren't good for me, that they had abused me, all of these things, right? Which seems kind of incredible to believe, right? Like, how could you believe that the people you lived with or the people who raised you did this to you, right? But if somebody's on the phone with you all the time, keeps you up at night, you know, and is in your ear constantly, doesn't let you think, doesn't give you space to think, then and then and establishes themselves in, as an authority beforehand, right? Then it's then it becomes well. If Larry said it, it must be true. Even if I didn't rem remember, or if I didn't know it, it's like oh, I must just not remember, even though it was a total lie, you know, to manipulate me. Um, so I would say that. I know this answer went long, but it's <laughs> really, I think this is re this was really important, what I wanted to, mm -hmm. want people to take away from this. It's not just what to recognize, it's what to do. Because mm -hmm. it's not enough, like, I could have, I can, I can answer that question, anyone, anybody can answer that question on a test. What are the signs of narcissism at this point, because it's, you know, culturally prevalent. Um, but what do you do when you have some, a narcissist in front of you, right? Like, what do you actually do? Like, I can tell you he's gonna attack you with a knife, a bat, and a gun, but do you know how to fight somebody who has a knife, or a gun, or a bat, right? So, I mean, I, I don't. <laughs> Um, but, so I would say the things to do beforehand to prepare are really to go into your self-worth and really, really find that because if you're secure in that, no one can, no one can take that from you. And that's what Larry did. That was his expertise. Um, then self-care, right? Like, you need to make sure you're sleeping and you're eating and go get massages, go get pedicures, do whatever you need to do to love yourself because that also keeps you healthy and sane. And then the last thing is, no is a complete sentence. Like, you can say no. Somebody can be as persistent or as you know, like, I love you, let's get married, or whatever you can, or I want you to do, I want you to go have sex with people you don't know. It's like, no, it's okay to say no. Thank you. I, I think we have a clip. So I just put these out last week. They were in a box and they've been here, but I wasn't ready yet. So this is me dipping my toe in the water. It's been over five years since I've seen my family. In Larry Land, these were all the bad people in my life. It's very hard to undo what he did. So I'm still very scared of my parents, my brother, my sister I want to talk to. I just don't know how I'm gonna do that right now. Um, according to Larry, they had also tried to kill me, but so it's, it's, it's a process. With a picture, the whole memory comes back. I'd see the picture and think about how sad I was. You were poor, living in a one-bedroom apartment, 10 people, in the basement of a house in the Bronx. Every year, there was some chaos, some crisis that we had to deal with. And I think about the Christmas that my parents went to Venezuela. 
they brought me back this really pretty dress. I'm going to show the dress to both of my parents, but I'm most excited about showing the dress to my dad. And I come out and my dad's not there. And um, actually, I want to change what I'm saying. This is Larry Brain. So because the story with that picture is that this whole drama about me showing my dad the dress may have happened or may not have happened. Larry was using my own memories, but then he twisted it and then he turned it into whatever, whatever was going to suit him. Yeah, yep, that's what happened. How did you figure that up? I could because it wasn't coming naturally. It was come. It was I was hearing Larry's narrative, like Larry telling the story, and he told it so many times that I learned. I mean, I learned it right. What was Larry's version? That I was so sad and that this crushed me and like ruined my relationships with men for the rest of my life. That this was the moment where Felicia is like broken. It's starting to build a foundation for the concept that I'm alone. But Larry will be there for me. But Larry will take care of me. But Larry loves me. Felicia. Yes. Although Larry succeeded in destroying for a while the bonds of love and support among you, your siblings, and your parents, he could not succeed permanently. That is one of the most hopeful and heartening messages of stolen youth. Could you please speak to that? Um, speak to the significance of that? Um, abusers' efforts to destroy survivors' family relationships, the devastating power of that, and, and, and what families in particular can do to try to rebuild relationships with their loved ones who are still under abuser control. Um, so the first part of your question was about uh, abusers, uh, how they use that, and how, how they use um, their families. And um, really use, use the relationships and the love that they have, at least Larry did. He used my love, my deep love for my family to, to control me, actually. So he leveraged, um, he held them hostage actually for me. So, you know, at the same time that he was saying that they wanted to hurt me, that they wanted to kill me, he knew that wasn't working. So then he switched to, he would switch to, well, if you don't do this, I'm gonna have your brother arrested. I'm gonna get your sister arrested. I'm gonna get your whole family arrested. And forget that, I'm gonna have them kill themselves. Um, Which was, I mean, he did, he, my, this, this makes me very angry um, because he did, he did hurt my family so much. And I'm lucky that my 
sister and my brother are alive, that I'm alive, um, because he was so vicious about it. And the thing though that he couldn't do was, I mean, and it, it worked for a while, right? Because I didn't talk to my parents for a long time and I was afraid, but ultimately, deep down, I knew that my parents loved me and I knew that no matter what I did, no matter what happened, I could go home. Um, and when, when you do, I mean, you could, in the clip, right, I was struggling because I was so afraid and I had to fight all of those Larry thoughts. Uh, but the close, the better my conversation, what Daniel was saying, because I didn't have that conversation with myself while I was with Larry. He monitored everything, mm -hmm. everything I wrote, everything I did. So I couldn't, there was no space for me to have that conversation, which is so important. Um, but the more I was able to do that after he was away, then I was able to connect again with that part of me and with, with my family. Um, but as far as what families could do when they're reuniting with their loved one, take it slow. Like, take it really slow. Poquito a poquito, that's what I told them. Like, I think everybody knows what that means now. <laughs> but little by little, um, because Everyone's been hurt. It's not just the person that was with the abuser. It's the family too. Like you're, you lost your loved one for however long, and you know he probably, the abuser probably had thrown all this vitriol at you and had your loved one say all these harmful things or had other people say harmful things about you. I mean, everyone gets hurt. It's not just the person that's with him. So you all have to take it slow. Um, but really trust your love. Trust your love in each other and have faith in, in what you already had before this person came and tried to knock, knock it all down. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. I think we have time for a few, couple of questions. One question. <laughs> I'm so sorry, this was so rich, but we're really interested in hearing. Okay, and, and um, yes, would you like to, can I give you the mic? Is there a mic? Right here, it's right here, in my hand. Hi, um, I'm Andrea, I actually work for Sanctuary. Um, and I guess this is mostly my question for Daniel and Felicia. Um, is there anything that your friends and family could have done from like the beginning that would have maybe avoided the entire situation? And I guess I'm asking if, like, how can we support friends from the beginning so that they avoid everything? Um, yeah, so I, I had, you know, Family and friends who tried various strategies. Um, so I, I don't know if this will, the story will make sense, but I had friends who went as far as to, um, they tried to arrange an event on campus at Sarah Lawrence that they said, they published it online in some Sarah Lawrence publication and said that I was performing at this event because they thought that I would see it and then show up to figure out what was going on. You know, so people try all these different things, and and now I mean we both interact with um, families, you know, um, loved ones of people in similar situations who ask this question. It's a really really hard one to answer. You know, for me from the beginning, it would have been a matter of creating a dynamic where I felt as if I could go to my parents with anything, right? Where they modeled messiness and imperfection, and that because I. 
I felt shame, right? I was in a hole and I, I felt as if I had to fix it myself and dig my way out because it was too, I couldn't admit to my family what had happened. I couldn't admit it to myself at first. So I, I think the thing I generally say is that anything that a parent or family member can do or a friend can do to just really set up a relationship with that loved one where it's clear that they can tell you anything, you know, and you're not gonna judge them and there's no shame between you. Um, because then if they find themselves in a, you know, a toxic relationship, um, they feel as if they could have a conversation with you that wouldn't threaten them. You know? Jump in very, very quickly. Um, I understand the value of the question, but you're sort of, but I think predators know that friends and family will intervene and friends and family are innocent and I'm going to say simple in a good sense of the word, they won't know how to stop predators. And so I don't think could some of their friends have done more? They, they were extraordinary. Your friends were extraordinary and they were young people. I think you really need authorities, people who are trained, people in power, people in criminal justice. Friends and family cannot do more. And it's wrong to put, I think wrong to put um, responsibility on them. It's just not possible. That's why we call these guys predators. That's why we sometimes use the word psychopath. They know what they're doing and they know how to shut down friends and family. Um, and just to add to that, that part of what made Larry so scary, at least for me, um, was he did know law enforcement. He knew a lot of high powered lawyers, doctors, people in the media. So, and it would happen all the time. The police would show up to the house because of some noise complaint, and there was obviously so much wrong when they showed up. But they would be, Larry would get them in conversation and be like, yeah, I was in the Marine Corps, you know, and then they would talk war stories, and they would, the police officers would like leave best friends with Larry, like shake hands and then just leave. No, no summons, no looking at the property, no talking to anybody. So I think that training, what Alexi had mentioned before, training law enforcement and, tra and having people in authority actually have awareness and take responsibility for what they're seeing and be willing to take action, that's really where it is. Because there's only so much you can do and like doctor said, she, they know what they're doing. They're gonna fly under the radar until they have you, you know, in, like tied enough that you can't leave. So you're not gonna see it. Thank you so much, Felicia and, and everyone. Um, please join me in thanking our incredible panel of experts. We have learned so much. Amazing and important. And also, please join me in thanking Divya, the woman and icon, and her incredible company. Thank you so much for your support for making this possible. We are so honored to be partnering with you. And um, and and as I say, and everyone onward, <laughs> onward. Thank you again. Would you like to say a few words? <laughs> yes, well, uh, I think it was, it was really wonderful. And, um, and um, I just say what I say to everybody, be true to yourself. Because as long as you are true to yourself, you are free. And um, that's the most important thing. And you show that. Thank you.